Welcome, uh, Sir Lord Richard Shotton. Uh, such an honour to have you back on the podcast again. It's been um, it's been at least a week since I spotted you in a crowd and, and, and winked and then didn't really get a chance to say hi, but uh, such an honour to see your wonderful face again. And uh, yeah, how are you doing? Very good, thanks. Very good to see you again. Same. <laughs> um, so originally uh, we wanted to, to start this project uh, podcast to talk about Richard's incredible new book it's called The Illusion of Choice. Ta-da, if you looking at the camera, um, I just showed the book. 16 and a half psychological biases that influence why we buy. Um, another must read if you're into the world of behavioral science. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's fan- fascinating. This is, how long was the gap between your last book and this? Probably a couple Pretty years? much exactly five years. Five so, years, wow. Yeah, um, nice. Choice Factory was 2018. This was February 2023. Wow. wow. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a phenomenal book. I, I read it on holiday. Um, it was, That's well, that is dedication. Yeah, it, was, well, it, it, it is one of those books uh, where, where you, you, you just want this, just full of lots of really interesting little stories. Um, and I, I, what I loved about it is also it's very easy to dip in and dip out of. Uh, yes, it works if you do it in a linear fashion, but I found it was equally fine just to just, yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Well, if, I'm glad if you I forgot something, I could go back yeah. in and still, still feel like it was part of a story so yeah, it's, it's pretty oh, that's, that's good definitely uh, an aim was to try and make it as straightforward and simple as, as as possible i definitely felt especially before the choice factor an awful lot of the commentary on behavioral science was unnecessarily complex uh, mm. there's even a phrase and the academics are the worst at this there's a <laughs> phrase people use drugly about psychologists which is they have physics envy so to try and prove that it's a proper hard science they wrap up their academic papers in an unnecessary level of statistics and an unnecessary level of, of, of jargon. So often you read the original papers and there's a really interesting point in there, but it is hidden in uh, reams of reams of unnecessary, unnecessary verbiage. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the things I love about your research so much. It's, like, is you, it's actually one of the things I admire the most about you is you, you're one of the few people, you weren't classically trained in behavioural science and I think most people right, listen listen to this probably aren't classically trained in 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 behavioral science or many many other topics but you've gone out of your way to to become a a, i mean for lack of a better word an expert in the subject but you've you've done it in a very practical way you've found ways to do your own experiments and and then without necessarily academically publishing them and hiding your data within lots of uh, uh, other yeah, yeah. waffle well, uh, you make it really clear and easy for people to understand um, th- that's absolutely the order i came to it when i yeah. was at university i don't think behavioral science was a option you you, you could have studied i came right. through this marketing first i was a media planner uh, started back in the year 2000 uh, it was marketing first and then i came across social psychology papers and psychology papers and saw them as a way to solve marketing problems so it's always been the practical side of the the topic that i've been interested in what was what was the first one you did the f- well the first bias i remember reading about was an idea called the bystander effect so i was working on the um, blood service account and read a um, it was a malcolm gladwell book called the tipping point yeah, this must book. be about two thousand and four. The, the, the back of that book, there is a you know a paragraph about two American psychologists called Latine and Dali, and they came up with this idea called the bystander effect, which is essentially if you ask everyone to help, you tend to find a diffusion of responsibility. So right. if you want people to come to your aid to behave altruistically, you've got to create a sense of personal responsibility. So reading about that, and I was at a media agency at the time, uh, I went and spoke to wonderful planner down at the creative agency a guy called charlie snow and said to him look there's this bias why don't we take it and rather than go out and say blood stocks low in england please donate why don't we try and create that sense of personal responsibility through a bit of regional targeting you know why don't we start saying blood stocks low in birmingham or basman now that is a very crude application and uh, of, a, of a bias but what mm. excited me was it only took a couple of weeks we got the results back and we saw that there'd been this 10 or 15, whatever it was, percent increase in response rates. So wow. I've always liked behavioral science because it has this practical application. Now, if, if you're a brand you've, and you've got you know, five or 10 or 100 people working in your insight department, it's never going to be enough. Behavioral science is essentially access to 
10,000 psychologists, academic psychologists who are out there now running studies that tell you about how people actually behave. So you've got this free resource, essentially. Why not draw on the knowledge and experimentation of the world's best scientists? So I think, think of this not as just an interesting academic topic, but it's something that can practically solve your problems. Where, where, where do you go? Where do you look? Is there a website that you go if you're trying to look for particular studies? Is it just as simple as a Google search or is it sort of something a bit more in depth? Well, that, that, that's a great question. So if you start with the academic papers, you've got to know exactly what you want because it can, I reckon it takes two, three hours to read through an academic paper. Yeah. And it is often mind-numbingly tedious because <laughs> yeah. there are these reams of statistics. You've almost got to decode what they're saying. Right. So if you just randomly go through academic studies, you could spend your whole lot, well, you could spend a year and you might have only found one or two interesting things. Right. So what I tend to do is try and find popular books written by academics. You then can race through those often in a day or two. Mm. And they will tell you a hundred studies maybe in one book. Five or ten of them might be relevant. Once you've found the relevant study, once you've read through a digest of it, then go and find the academic paper and check everything that's all right, check to see if there's any kind of idiosyncrasies that you might, might make it uh, irrelevant. But I would start really broad and populist and then move down to the, the actual paper. That's such great advice. And also maybe helps explain why your Twitter account is always on fire. It's like, so if anyone doesn't follow Richard Shotton on Twitter, do right away. I think it's R Shotton or at R Shotton. Um, yeah. But uh it's one of my favorite accounts to follow because you always are taking these little snippets from books or articles that you've read. And there'll always be some like fascinating little story that, that shares some amazing things. I'm, I'm guessing this is, this is why you're reading these well, to try and yeah. find yeah. I originally used Twitter as a repository. I wanted to use it as my own store. So right. I couldn't be bothered to write out some of the <laughs> uh, studies from books. I just took photos and posted them on Twitter. Now nice. that's, it kind of works well in some respects, yeah. but actually the problem with Twitter is that it's not a great for, as a search function. Yeah. So it hasn't worked as a repository for me, but hopefully some of the studies people find, find useful. Oh, it's incredible. And, and you never know, Elon Musk might, might so, solve the search uh, query function. I know he's talked about it. Or, or, or you'll have to transport everything over to threads. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I've, I've, um, I've dilly-dallied with threads and uh, from my understanding, it's already kind of, declining yeah. in usage so my laziness might have meant that i don't yeah. Really bother. yeah it's it's a tricky one isn't it when new new social media sites come out that are essentially a replica of an existing one you, you kind of you know I, I, yeah i i could see that there was a huge huge uh upsurge in, in usage of it and you can you know get all these notifications saying you know a million people have followed you uh, not a million i wish i was that popular um but <laughs> it's it's uh but then, yeah, it, as you say, it seems to have gone gone quite quite quickly. Like I think the the, the key people who who were doing really interesting stuff seem to have stayed on Twitter. It is a kind of, I mean, Twitter's different things for different people. It kind of depends on who you follow as to what you're going to see there. So if you want to create a space of happiness and wonderful content, follow people who are generally very positive and who, who you find interesting if if you want to be annoyed then i don't know follow yeah. politicians I mean, um, it, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one because i think there is snarkiness and yeah. you know, people are often looking to to criticize and there is a definite downside to twitter but it still is pretty amazing that you can yeah. you know, select 50 odd people to follow on a you know, I've just used it for marketing and advertising and behavioral science. And you're getting some amazing output from people on a what is a very, very niche topic. So mm -hmm. maybe applying the mute button is what I'm doing a bit more. And if people are just out to cause offense, then yeah, just, it just, it's just not worth the, yeah, it's not worth the aggro. Mm. Agree. Anyway, sorry. Massive topic diversion. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. and your book. Yeah. Um, yeah, one of the things I loved about the book actually as well, which is another reason why I think if anyone anyone is listening, you you'll you'll really enjoy it. Is you take people through a hypothetical day, and you link the behaviour back to 
the behavioural change biases back to real life things that everyone might encounter in their day job, regardless of your job, um, which I thought was was marvellous as well. Um, yeah, it was. Um, uh, I think I might have read the. I think it was the. I read a book called The Norm Chronicles, where they followed right. someone through a day, and I thought, well, that's a lovely mechanic. So for the choice factory and this, that's essentially what I've done. You, know, you follow an unnamed person, which is essentially positioned as you, for the illusion of choice. There are 16 and a half uh, different events that happen. Maybe you get a pay rise, someone else is begging money, and you react in a certain way. And then what I do in each chapter is take one bias or family of biases often to explain why you reacted in the way that you did. So each chapter essentially revolves around here's a set of academic studies here's the evidence for them here's some experiments i've done that prove they're still relevant today and then the most important bit is always the the so what so most of the chapters look what do you do differently as a small business person as a marketer as somebody who's trying to communicate effectively what do you do differently now you know about uh the bias of concreteness or the red sneaker effect or, or the bias of precision you mentioned pay rises. I mean, that's a good general one. All we could all do with a pay rise. Uh, what's your advice there? <laughs> oh, well, unfortunately, the, 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 the bias, I think that chapter is all about uh, fairness. So there's some wonderful studies um, and around the idea that people's reaction to a wage offer or a price commercially is not just... Um, to do with the amounts involved it's what they think other people have have received right. there's a really nice um study i think it's a university of washington study where two psychologists um go up to students and it is students so take it with a pinch of salt but they go up to students in their first day at university and say will you take part in a psychology study tomorrow and we'll pay you seven pounds seven dollars yeah and they get i think it's 70 odd percent of people saying yes then they go up to another group of people fresh group of people and say we'll pay you eight dollars but they then mention a little white lie they say oh, i'm really sorry but we we're paying people ten dollars earlier but we've run out of cash now even though that second group are getting more money there is a i think it's a 25 percent reduction in people who wow. accept the offer so that seems to run at first counter to classical economics Hmm. surely people should be interested in the amount of money they get for a, a job rather than what others are getting paid. But the argument is that we are hardwired to be deeply attuned to fairness. And if we feel that others have got a better deal, it reframes how we look at the offer. Now, you can take a principle like that and you can apply it, I think, on a grand scale or a very, very tactical scale. The grand scale might be to think, well, how do I, as a marketer, reframe my competitors behavior as transgressing fairness norms you know, that would be a large hard to do potentially very effective um, way of changing behavior you know think about direct line that line yeah. in the 1980s how they reframed the insurance broker not as a useful professional who gave you advice but they positioned them as leeches who were just sucking out um, um, fees and adding costs on so that would be a big way of applying it tiny way of applying it a tactical way would be to think of your e-commerce site. Most e-commerce sites today transgress fairness norms. What they do is when you've, let's say you've bought a pair of trainers, you've put them in the basket, $100, you're completely happy with these trainers. As you're just about to click on the buy button, what normally sits above that button? In most e-commerce sites, there is a big box that says, Watch, um, put your discount code in here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so people would have been completely happy with $100 price. They think you've got these amazing trainers. Yeah. But the discount bo box essentially tells them loads of other people are getting this cheaper. Yes. That transgressive fairness norm and that University of Washington study suggests an awful lot of people will no longer be content with the offering. So I've, as a I've done exactly brand, that. Yeah. Get rid of that discount box. Only show it to people who have come via an affiliate or make it so recessive, like, Mm. Uber do this very well. Maybe just put a little, tiny little link on rather than a big box. So only people who are really looking for the box or the, for the code will find it. You could you could also say, I think um, we played around with it a bit, you could say like redeem gift voucher. 
Yeah. Very, yeah, yeah. Or you then, could, yeah. yeah, go on. Yeah. Well, well then, then you're thinking it's it's not necessarily a discount code. It's a, If it's a gift voucher, it's like, yeah, well, this is where you go if someone's gifted uh, me something. So uh, Absolutely. That'd be a lovely way of doing it. Um, yeah. And people shouldn't underestimate the importance of, of language and how that affects mm. interpretation of events. There's a really nice set of studies by Loftus and Palmer, uh, like a 1974 study that I, that I talk about in the book, where they recruit a group of people and they play them a video of two cars crashing together. So everyone watches exactly the same clip. And you can still get this online. If you Google something like Loftus and Palmer um, framing video car crash, it'll yeah. come up. And then the, the experiment is they get people to estimate the speed of the cars. But some people are asked, how fast do you think the cars going were going when they collided? Others were asked, how fast do you think the cars were going when they smashed together? And I think there's five or six different verbs that are used to different groups. Bump, smash, collided, contacted. Yeah. And what they find is there is a 25, 27% swing in viewers' estimates of the speed dependent on the verb that's used. So if you heard smashed, people think it's about 40 miles an hour, the car's going on average. If you hear bumped, contacted, it's about 30 miles an hour. Their argument was that the language that's used to describe something acts as a, a lens or a filter through which we interpret events. So you change the language that you use to describe something, you change people's reaction. Their interest was actually with witness testimonies, and they were very right. interested in how if a police person was being kind of manipulative, the yeah. language they used when interviewing witnesses could change people's recollection. That's where they started. But you can see this being applied by brands or, or politicians. So, 100%. Yeah. In, in the US, the big one is there is an argument between Democrats and Republicans for an inheritance tax. Oh, yes. Democrats want to call it death tax. No, estate tax, because yeah. that emphasises you know, the, the richness you need to fall foul of this tax, whereas the Republicans call it death tax because they're trying to draw attention to the fact that it happens at a very inopportune time. And yeah. Frank Luntz has polled people on their opinion of this tax. And if you call it a death tax, far, far lower agreement with it than if you call it an estate tax. Exactly yeah, the same, the same we had policy. the same argument in the UK, I think, if I remember rightly. Like, um, spare room subsidy or the bed... What was it, yeah. the spare room subsidy or the... What was it the way? The bedroom tax, yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. You, know, you see it a lot in politics, arguing about yeah. the descriptor is, is, is important. So in the same way, going back to your point of you know, add gift voucher, add discount code leads yeah. to a very different set of expectations. You might be doing the same thing, but you have a very mm -hmm. different reaction. So, that, I mean, the only thing I can think of was on my head for, for uh, behavioral biases to use for, uh, for getting a wage increase is probably that what's the, is it, you'll remember the name of this. I'm hopeless at names. The one where um, they looked at the judges and they were dishing out harsher sentences just before lunch. Oh, now, that's an interesting one you mentioned that. So unfortunately, that is... So the, the, the principles... Well, the principle seems to be vindicated elsewhere. It's right. called decision fatigue. Right. The study, the Israeli judges one, has become... Or has come under criticism. Right. Because the argument is... And, and also, what, what, the, what the Danziger study originally showed was um, proportion of people who were... Um, I don't know, was it let out early by judges starts off high in the mornings and then drops over time till they have lunch. They come back yeah. from lunch, it's high again and it drops down over time. Yeah. And they then they're getting harsher sentences or something nearer the yeah. real time before and the dancing argument was it was it took mental effort to um, break against the norm and allow mm. people early release or uh, shorter sentences. Yeah. And their argument was well over time we expend energy we become fatigued and then it's harder to kind of make those decisions so that that was the that was the argument right unfortunately someone looked at the data and said well wait a minute the people that are going in front of the judges are not the same over time often the right. harder cases are left towards the end of the the sessions so right. that study came under right. quite a lot of scrutiny and people felt that in the end it probably wasn't a robust study However, there are other studies around doctors prescribing antibiotics 
which show something very similar that um, doctors tend to give out antibiotics too readily because they right. know that it will get the patient out of their office and it'll make for an easy yeah. life. So what tends to happen is the inappropriate prescription of antibiotics starts reasonably low during the day. And just as Danzig found, but in a different setting, it goes up until lunch, drops back a little bit, then keeps on increasing until it peaks just before people go uh, away for the day. So, so the we, argument is we expend energy over time. We therefore become exhausted and find it harder to move away from what the easy course of behavior is so if you want to get someone to break their habits if you want to get someone to behave in a way that is uh, tough for them better to reach them early in the morning rather than later on in the afternoon and evening yeah so we can't necessarily help you with your salary but if you want more uh, more antibiotics well there are you know if, we do, if we're talking i mean this might be the most useful thing but if we're talking about if people were there are a couple of studies, actually, I think, in all seriousness, that if you were trying to get a raise, you could think about. So the first one is, and this is why the book has 16 and a half <laughs> chapters. The half chapter is all about the power of precision. So yeah. there is a, and I'm not even sure if I've mentioned this in the book, because I think I might have stumbled across this study after I finished writing it, after it had gone to print. But Uber have a team of, behavioral um, scientists and they're constantly running experiments so if you've been in uber you've probably been in one of their studies now these are this is a brilliant database because you don't know you're in a study it's yeah. a really realistic circumstance and it's a massive sample so it gets yeah. around some of those problems that afflict like the 1950s psychology studies and one of the studies they've looked at is willingness to accept a surge price and the key finding was if you send out a message selling someone it's a 2x surge price, they are less likely to take that ride than if it's a 2.1x surge price. Now, the argument here is people assume a round price has just been plucked out of the air and it's probably been exaggerated to the benefit of, of the brand. So they're a bit sceptical. They think it's overinflated. They think it's too pricey. If people see a precise price, they think that it's been worked out very accurately and only a small little margin's gone on. So the application there for a brand is if you are charging someone five pounds your lager, charge them five pounds and five pence. You're in a rare situation which you can increase the price. You'll make the price more appealing and you've got more margin. Flip that to a wage debate scenario. Don't go in and ask for a ten thousand pound rise because it sounds like you just you don't know what you're talking about. Just pluck this number out of the air. Give a really specific number. Now you want a ten thousand four hundred fifty pound rise. <laughs> Suddenly, your the negotiation you get into will not be, well, we won't pay you ten, we'll pay you seven. It will be, we won't pay you ten four, we'll pay you ten one. You, yeah. you narrow down that that space for um, negotiation. So I think that's an interesting one that is very, very simple to apply. It's de definitely a genius one. I remember, I think you wrote in your last book as well, one of the examples of, I remember from that was, I think it was car prices or, yeah, car price negotiations. If you had round numbers, you would... Um, uh, uh, they would they would discount it more on a, on a round number like you, you, your negotiation was was worse or whatever if it was a if it was a, like yeah I'm going to talk about the um uh there's a there's a you know a couple of studies around um precise precise pricing yeah. why I like um I think uh it's a Yanashevsky uh shoe study which I might, I might have mentioned previously the reason I really like that Uber one is it's not in a lab setting. You know, the, yeah. the, the Yanashevsky Institute, I think they, they began by you know, showing people pictures of blocks of cheese or right. pet rocks and saying <laughs> either it's to some people it costs £10, to others it costs £10.75. Yeah. And they did find that the people thought when they were asked, to, when the participants were asked to estimate the actual value of the item, they were much closer when it was a precise price. Mm. But I've always had a little bit of doubt about that study because it was such... Um, 
a kind of forced academic abstract study. I think the Uber one has greater validity because it has such realism. And if people are actually um, in a real life purchasing situation, they are behaving the way they normally would. They're not thinking, well, how should I behave? We did. Um, I, I have some some random experiences when we were buying a house at the end of last year. When we put our offer in, we put our offer in a very precise number. I think it was ah. whatever it was, you know, yeah. hundreds of thousands plus, you know, one hundred and twenty five yeah. pounds or something. And the 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 offer we got back uh, was they wanted obviously they wanted more, but they didn't they didn't actually raise it that much. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know because I don't know. I didn't try the same thing with a thousand different buyers at the same no, price, but know. it certainly seem to work like i i uh, yeah when you're going into negotiations using those rounder numbers it seems to make it easier for them to just go oh well we'll just go up to the next round number but, yeah i, I think um, it yeah. it suggests that you are open to change you've not got mm. particularly firm views because it's mm. it is a suspiciously rounded number yeah, if you want to give a signal that this is something you strongly believe in that you've put effort into finding out it's the right amount give the yeah. people a precise number it doesn't yeah. actually matter if what you've really done is plucked a number out of the air and yeah. then added it a few other yeah. extras on till it becomes very precise. But yeah. that's that. I mean, that, that's one I would apply. The, the other one, that, the famous one, is the principle of anchoring. The idea that if you throw out a large number, even if it's irrelevant, people tend to use that as a benchmark to start their estimations of their counter response. And even though they adjust from your initial number, they tend not to adjust far enough. So if you go into a negotiation, you're being paid £50,000 and you say you want 55, the likely that you end up with, let's say, 53. If you go out and say you want £60,000, and I'm forgetting the precision bit, let's put that to the side mm. as a separate overlay, you're mm. more likely to end up at like fifty-four or £55,000. Uh, you know, the, the boss who is looking at your number will take your initial suggestion and then they will begin a, adjusting off yeah. it. And they never, or people tend not to adjust far enough. So you, I think the argument there is ask for an amount that you're almost embarrassed, or you are embarrassed about, frankly, you're on the edge of embarrassment. Go out with that number. You won't get it, but you'll end up with a higher salary than if you just went worked out what you're actually worth and, and, and opened with that starting offer. I remember growing up, the advice was always think of what you want and double it um, and, and then ask that. I, I, was, I was wondering whether you were going to say in your example, you could go in and say, look, boss, I'm not going to ask you for a, for a £1.5 million bonus <laughs> anchoring the £1.5 million and then say, actually, what I need is, is 50000 It makes the, the 50000 yeah. seem <laughs> Now, <laughs> straying away from experiments into kind of expert point of views, <laughs> and so I don't this one people have to we love these don't worry yeah they'll have to take their own opinion on whether it's with anything but there's a there's a really good negotiation book by Chris Voss called Split the Difference yeah it's brilliant and he talks about anchoring and he makes the assertion but I don't think he gives any evidence for it I mean he's the guy's got a lot of experience in FBI negotiating all sorts or negotiate at least um and he says anchoring works but if you stretch the bounds of credibility it can backfire. It, 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 he right. says it shows that you're you're negotiating in bad faith. Right. So his warning would be: don't go in and say the million pound salary. Yeah. It's think about you know there is a grey zone of what is a reasonable amount. Just make sure you're right at the edge and the boundary mm -hmm. of that that grey zone. So I think that inkling of I'm starting to feel like I'm pushing it too far. That's where you want to I think nice start with. But Brilliant. He, that's his argument, and I've, I think it sounds, sounds sensible. But it sounds sensible, yeah. Yeah I, think, yeah. I think I mean that's the great thing about human psychology is mo most of it. If it sounds sensible and it kind of makes sense to you, it, often there is something in it. Um, you know, if you found yourself going, "Oh yeah, I've done that or thought that before," then then it, there probably is something in it. Yeah, well, um, there, was a, there was amazing because there's always this problem with some studies don't replicate, hmm. and I'll try and dig out the link. Maybe we can put it in somewhere. But there was a study done where random people on the street were shown psychology studies and they had to say do you think this is a genuine finding or is it bogus what well, has it later been debunked yeah. 
Now, people didn't get it exactly right. People were pretty spot on. I always think it's a fair way hmm. of, if you have no other information, Google's not available, you can't search for some reason. One thing to think is, does this feel like hmm. horseshit? And if it does, <laughs> uh, within a year or two, the study often gets re- retracted. I, I think there is a smell test that's worth applying. Um, I agree. You know, all that stuff around priming, holding hot drinks, and therefore thinking the person you're talking to is warmer, it never felt like it was genuine. I'm not surprised that stuff has often been retracted. Yeah, yeah. Don't often tell me that. You're I dumb. always give people a hot drink when I meet them. Oh, do you? Okay. okay. <laughs> well, I make them sit I probably think the you're a very nice person for giving them a drink, <laughs> but it would be no different than if you gave them the cold drink. <laughs> yeah. I know um, one of the other things I thought you expanded on in this book, which I loved, was you're talking about moments in people's lives where um, they were more likely to create or, or start a new habit. And then the... Yeah. Older book, I think we you talked about nine enders, and yeah. then this one uh, you you, you start effect. found mm. some other stuff, yeah, which I thought was brilliant because it's way more. You don't have to wait to someone to become twenty nine or thirty nine, which is helpful. Yeah, <laughs> and again, again, I can't remember. So I can't remember if I found this study after I'd written the book. I think I might have <laughs> even gone back and um edited it right at the last moment right but the fresh start effect is in this was always in there it's essentially a lovely set of studies by Catherine milkman it's the idea that we behave in the same way again and again because we feel a need to be consistent with our past selves you know we feel like a hypocrite if we start behaving differently but her argument is when we enter new time periods that link with our past self is weakened and we become more open to change so her argument is target people at the start of a new season start of the year, start of the month, after their birthday, after a public holiday, any of these fresh start moments are characterised by a greater openness to changing behaviour. And she runs a number of different studies that show this is the case. But what I came across later in a behavioural insights team report was an amazing study from the West Midlands Police who applied this in 2017 or 2018. They uh, did a test, sent out, I think it's 2077, uh, emails or letters to criminals you know people who had repeatedly been caught offending and they essentially said to them do you want to start a new life if so we will help you if not we know where you are and we're you know investigating you so you know they would give them an offer to help them with training help them mm. uh, find a job and things now when they sent those out at random times there was a vanishingly small response rate 2.6 percent of people called the helpline to get uh the support something like 2.6 percent, i think mm. other people were sent uh, a birthday card with the same message just after their birthday and there you see i think it's a 50 55 percent increase i think it's 4.05 percent wow. of people responded wow. so i love that as an example of even hardened criminals these are probably the hardest yeah. people to change in the in the world even they are more likely to make a radical change in their life if you harness the fresh start effect, wow. if you target them after their birthday. Now so, I know why I got that letter um, and, and why I started this. It's, uh, you know, my, my, my days of crime are behind me now. Um, it's, it's an element, I think, of you know, anything that is embedded in your yeah. life, anything that's a sense of your identity, moving away from it is really hard because it feels like you have yeah. wasted previous efforts you are being a hypocrite but yeah. if you meet people at these transition moments that kind of ball and chain of their history that drag on um starting anew is slightly weakened and they become more open to change so frankly if you're selling yogurts or gym plans or uh, trainers your audience is going to be a hell of a lot more easy to influence mm. than hardened criminals. So if it can work for the West Midlands police, I'm sure it can work for those other, other brands. I think it's also genius if you're, if you're a smaller brand where you, you don't have budget necessarily to, to, to just have an always on kind of campaign or something. You, you could just go, okay, well, we know that, I don't know, the coronation yeah. is coming up, like bam, we'll do everyone after that. Or if there's whatever bank holiday, like, uh, you know, the day after that, like, that that would be so good if you could i mean well, yeah you just get your facebook have i mean certainly used to be able to target on facebook by people's birthdays you could identify yeah. people a week either side um a lot of people if they've got a database built up will know when their birthdays are 
Mm. Um, you know, there are a lot of data signals out there if you put the effort into finding them. Yeah, it's just genius. I love that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, look, I know, I know you said you've got to run away, so yeah, sorry, <laughs> take up too much of your time. But um, yeah, were there, were there any other things that you you absolutely loved in this book? That uh, I mean, look, regardless, anyone has to buy this book. It's no, it's, amazing. It's, it's a commitment. Uh, if, if you've listened to any further, you've got to buy it. So it's uh, all. <laughs> um, yeah, the bit. I mean, the bits I really liked were I did a lot more on how to break and then recreate habits there's a lot more on that mm. that was quite interesting and there's a mm. lot more on pricing like how do you make the same price appear more powerful i think that's an absolutely fascinating area so i think those are all very relevant to lots of brands uh and then the studies around fairness i think are less well known but have you know some quite interesting applications yeah it's brilliant well, look, thank you so much for taking Excellent. time and and um yeah, anyone who's listening, you know, obviously, book is available at all good bookstores and uh, Amazon and everything else. Well. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and then uh, and then also don't forget to follow Richard on at uh, R Shotton on on Twitter, um, or possibly not Thread. Thread. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. I really Good. appreciate Thanks it. Um, nice chat. It's always an honour, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll look forward to hopefully seeing you again in real life. Thank you so thank much. You Cheers, Richard. Cheers. Awesome.